I've used Stingray filters since almost the beginning of my career. As soon as I became aware of them and, and tried some out in the field, I thought they were the best ones made. It was obvious to me. They're very consistent. If you get a, a two-stop grad filter from Singray, they're all exactly the same, which is unusual in this business. He makes filters that are unique. A variable ND, which is amazing. The color combo, which is a polarizer color and intensifier filter. Um, the soft ray. Here's a Singray uh, variable ND. It looks like this. You just turn it like you turn a polarizer and it just gets darker. It enables you to get much longer shutter speeds in bright light that does not give you a long exposure time naturally. Another filter I use of Sing Rays is the Tony Sweet Soft Ray. This is a much softer, soft focus filter because it's a very nice glow on brightly lit subjects. I also use the, uh, the full line of uh, the Sing Ray Graduated NDs, Hard Edge, Soft Edge, Reverse. He has a, a larger line where they're like Lee size filters, very large. Uh, you can, you can like hand hold those very easily and I recommend them highly. I've been using Sing Ray filters for a number of years now. I've been working in long exposure and it was always difficult with fixed filters. I was forced to work very slowly and with inanimate objects. I couldn't really photograph people. By the time you got the image composed with a fixed filter, removing it, putting it back on, the scene had changed. When the variable ND filter came out, it literally revolutionized my work. With the very ND filter, I can be up and shooting in just literally seconds. When I went to the death camps and photographed the ghosts of Auschwitz and Birkenau, it was only because of the very ND filter I was able to capture these images. If I were forced to work with ND filters, I could not have photographed that body of work. I use the very ND filter along with the Morslow filter, which gives me between 8 and 13 f-stops of neutral density. This allows me to shoot very long exposures, even in bright sunlight. ND filters are the best, but a variable filter is even better. I've been shooting scenic photography now for some time and I can recall the very first time I started using these filters. It appeared as though I was finally able to capture a scene as my eyes saw it. Right here we've got a graduated neutral density filter or grad ND filter. This one's made by Singray. Many scenes that we shoot in landscape photography have varying light from shadow to highlight. The challenge that we face is balancing those highlights with the shadows. This filter really helps us to balance those highlights and bring the dynamic range or the, the stops of light into an area where the camera can capture it as our eyes see it. Perhaps the next most useful filter that I use in my landscape photography is a polarizing filter. And these can be used in a number of different ways, but primarily you're using them to take glare or reflection off water. In addition, it really helps to deepen skies and help clouds um, kind of to pop on those skies. So that was just a brief look at the different type of landscape filters that I use. Um, we'll be taking a more in-depth look throughout the program at how we can use these different filters and apply them in different lighting situations, in different scenes, um, and in different types of images. And really they're going to help you to uh, take your landscape photography to the next level. These are all the split grad neutral density filters that I use, and they're all resin, so they're not glass. You can just drop glass once, and you tend to drop these out in the field once in a while. Just to describe what these are, that's a one-stop grad ND. It holds back one stop of light, two stops, three stops, gets darker progressively, four stops. They're soft-edged filters, so there's a graduation. So the uh, one stop at the very top, then it graduates down to nothing down here. Two stops right here and then graduates down to nothing and then three stops right here, etc. Four stops at the very top. The next, these are hard edge filters where three and four stop hard edge. You would use these specifically if, you, if there was a hard line, like a hard horizon line. Like uh, say you want a shot of a, a dark beach and uh, the ocean's a straight line. You would like meter the beach, brighten it up and hold back the sky. Straight line at the horizon. Shooting into the Grand Canyon, for example, there's a straight line on top of that. The canyon's dark, you want to brighten that up with your exposure. And then hold back the sky, straight line, straight hard line. You would use these there. You would use the graduated grad NDs for like if you have a foreground and there's a sky and it's like just like a somewhere open where there's no real hard line, couple of trees, whatever. These are kind of unique. They're are reverse grads. An example where these would be used is, for example, if you're if the sky at the horizon is extremely bright, like a dawn, very bright red line, for example, then the sky gets darker as you go up. 
if you use a split grad, it's going to make your sky real black up here because it gets darker as it goes up also. On a, a, a reverse grad, it's dark at the ribbon where the, the uh, bright horizon is. And then as the sky gets darker, this gets lighter. So it keeps a more natural look. And this is a four to a one stop. So it's basically the same thing, just more, much brighter sky. And it's, it's, it's the same idea. Little ribbon down here kind of holds back the real bright light at the horizon and then it gets lighter so your sky doesn't get too black as it goes up to the top. Okay, one more final tip on these split grad NDs here. They each come in a separate case and they can get real like in your camera bag everywhere you can't find them fast enough. There's a thousand cases in your bag. Here's a quick little tip. An old CD case had laying around and I've got these labeled one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, three stop, hard edge, etc. Then you just pop these things right in here, colored side down to avoid fingerprints. There's one stop, two stop, etc. Okay, let's get started with our very first shot. We'll make this a simple 30 second exposure and let's talk about what you'll need to know for this shot. First, you're gonna to need to know how to put your camera into manual exposure mode. Secondly, you're gonna to need to know how to turn your autofocus off in case our automatic focus won't work. And we're gonna be using in this shot our variable neutral density filter with one stacked filter. That'll give us from eight to 13 stops of neutral density. We're gonna be using a shutter release so we don't vibrate the camera, and of course, a tripod. So let's get started. The most important thing in a long exposure is you reduce vibration. So we have a good tripod. We get it set very firmly, especially in sand. You want to be careful. You don't want it to be sinking over 30 seconds. Next, turn off your image stabilization. What happens is in a long exposure, it sees movement and tries to compensate for it, creating a blurry image. And I, I've done that so many times. Turn off your image stabilization. Now let's compose our shot. Because it's so dark with neutral density filters, we're gonna open up our variable filter so it's the lightest it can be, making it easier to compose. I'm going for a little bit of a wide shot. I've got this great, these cliffs in the background going off at an angle, and I've got these waves breaking on the rocks in the foreground. It'll make a really interesting shot. Now I've got some kayakers out there, but they're not gonna even show up probably because they're moving. That's the great thing about a 30 second exposure. Let's take our first exposure and see where we're at. Now we're in manual mode, so I'm gonna match my needles and turn the variable density filter to reduce the amount of light until I have a correct exposure. Now let's take it and see what it looks like. Five, four, It looks good, but it's a little bright, so I'm gonna darken that just a little bit. I'm gonna go down to about two-thirds of an f-stop underexposed. Now the waves are a little bit calm right now, and the timing of the waves will have a great effect on how your water looks. So let's wait for another set to come in. Hey, here's one now. Obviously, we don't want any movement during the exposure. And if there's high winds and you have a long lens, that can be really problematic. So I'll often get my jacket and create a wind block between me and the camera. Much, much better. So what we've got here is some great foreground motion and then the glassy water from the long exposure and then the fixed cliffs just dwindling out into the horizon. So this is a good first shot using a basic 30 second exposure and a variable neutral density filter. We've got a kind of a fairly cloudy evening, definitely have uh, some decent potential for a good sunset light. Um, we're hoping for that magic light. Whether it comes or not, we're going to walk away with a keeper for sure. 
Um, we chose this location. Basically, we've got quite a bit to work with here in terms of uh, compositional elements. We've got some water. Um, we've got some nice shoreline here where the water has cut away, giving us nice leading lines. We've got some great reflective surfaces where whether we get that magic light or not, we can work it with a golden blue polarizer. And in addition, we have options as to whether we'll shoot into or away from the sun. We've got some great uh, mountaintops and ridgelines back there that if for some reason we do get great sunset light, they'll be receiving that nice warm light. Uh, if for some reason we don't have breaks in the clouds and the clouds light up with color, we have a location where we can actually shoot into the sun and capture that color in the clouds. So I think the more that you shoot in diverse conditions, the more you realize that great images don't come from happenstance. They require forethought, they require planning, of course they're going to benefit from a little bit of luck and they also um, benefit from a knowledge of how to use the tools that are going to help you to capture the conditions best. So as you look through the lens here, and I'm using live view on this camera, um, you can twist it and see the effects that are taking place with the gold and blue from gold to kind of a more faded gold um, to a blue to a more intense blue and as you twist that you can kind of decide what you like best. So as I'm twisting it here you know, I'm going to try my first shot with a fairly intense gold hue to that water. Um, the next key part of this image is balancing the sky with the three stop reverse ND grad. Um, because we're shooting wide angle here, um, we really need to be careful that we don't get our fingertips in the frame. Um, so definitely pay attention to your LCD when you're reviewing your image. So the way I hold this when I do this is I take the camera and put it right up against uh, the front element here. You slide it down. So we can see kind of right where we want that transition line. You can see as you move it up and down, it's really helpful with live view. You can kind of see the changes that are taking place. And then I actually grab the other part of the filter with this trigger finger that's on my cable release. And so I, I really am able to keep my fingers out of here. Um, and then we're simply just going to click the shutter, review the shot right there. We can see that I'm pretty pleased with the results we're getting there. We are losing a little bit of detail in those mountains and trees that are jutting across the horizon. If it's such an insignificant part of this image, I don't really care. You gotta decide there's certain parts of your image that you're gonna have to sacrifice, and what we want is the sky and this foreground stream. So we're gonna shoot one more just like this. Slide it down, over. Make sure and keep our fingers out of the frame. Wanna make sure you're covering that entire front element. Okay. The golden blue polarizer is somewhat unpredictable, which is part of the reason it's so fun to shoot with. Um, we're going to go ahead and twist it here, and I'm going to do a little bit less intense shade of gold. All right. We're going to go ahead right here. Slide that reverse ND grad right there. All right, so just to actually demonstrate the difference of shooting with and without the reverse ND grad filter and with and without the golden blue polarizer, we're actually gonna shoot some images here um, without those actual tools so you can see the difference that it makes. Um, here we're just gonna go ahead and um, shoot an image with the golden blue polarizer minus the reverse ND grad. So what you're gonna notice here is we're still gonna have some nice color on the water, but our sky is gonna be pretty washed out. All right, so uh, now we're gonna remove the gold and blue polarizer here. I'm gonna adjust this exposure just slightly. And here we go, there's our shot without the gold and blue polarizer and literally it is lifeless. <laughs> so we're really creating our own magic here, which um, especially when it comes to assignment photography and commercial photography, and a client needs an image regardless of the conditions you're given, you really have to make lemonade out of lemons. You really have to play, play the game with the cards that you're dealt. So having an understanding of these tools is gonna give you a greater latitude to come home with a keeper regardless of what you go out with. All right, so one of the things to be concerned with, with, with water is glare. This is the uh, Singray Color Intensifier Polarizer, which actually punches the color up as well as, as polarizes the glare out of the water. Now, you don't want to polarize the glare out completely because it'll appear that the water is just standing still. 
you want to leave some of the glare in the shirt that, that the water's moving. So we're going to have a look at it first, and it does make a difference. Always hold it up and look through it. It does make a difference. We're going to put, that, put this on here real quick, and we're going to compose this shot and see what happens. So we're pretty much uh, on a tripod because it will be a fairly long exposure. We want to leave some glare in there. And we're going to get the white sky out. We don't want the white sky. We're composing very tightly in here. And we're going to meter something that's gray. If I see a gray card right there, I'm going to meter right there. And we're going to spot meter that. And we're going to say that's approximately average. And the flowers are very still right now. So we're going to hurry up before they start moving. Okay, that's not bad. That's fine. That's actually quite good. Exposure's right on the money. So we put on the variable ND filter to get a much longer exposure time. So rather than about one second, we're up to um, up to eight seconds. So much, much longer exposure time. And then we're going to fire this off. The flowers are uh, amazingly still. Let's see what we get. Very large foreground flowers, exaggerated perspective, and then the, the background falls way off into the distance. Pretty cool. You don't get flowers like this very often down here, right in the crack of these rocks that use as foreground subjects that often. So let's see how we're doing. All right, that's uh, that's a winner. We can do one more. Now let's try uh, to get about 10 seconds. You get a real sheen in the water, a much um, much lower exposure. Now the flowers are moving a little bit because the wind's picking up, but that's okay. Now we're at 10 seconds. And 10 seconds is a long time. Let's give it a shot. See what we get. Get some movement. But the main thing is the water will look much, much smoother at the longer exposure time. We have that. We have that. Yep. Yep, big difference. Okay, so we shot one at a relatively short exposure and one at a very long exposure. Big difference in the water flow. Let's move on, the light's good. We're gonna get out of here. I'm a bit too high here, but we'll try it and we'll see what it looks like. That's pretty nice. We're gonna polarize out just part of that. Hyperfocal, one third up into the picture space. Just partial polarization, not total. You want to have some movement show up. All right, so I'm going to meter that F22, absolutely. That should be a long exposure. Right now, uh, if I meter that at an, at an average scene, it's 2.5 seconds. Let's try that and see what happens. Got a lift, there it goes. See what we got, if anything. All right, that ain't too bad. We need a much longer exposure. What I want to do is to increase the exposure so I get more light here, and then I want to get a two-stop right in. Even though there's no, there's no sky, it's brighter out there than it is here. So I want to get a two-stop grad ND and hold back the top part of the picture while I brighten up the foreground part here. So, yeah, I'm thinking if I um, brighten that up by a third of a stop and then hold back two stops up top, now there's a way to calculate that. But I've done these enough, I kind of know I'm in the ballpark most of the time. So we'll just hold that over the top. Right about there. And we're at six seconds, so I gotta keep that on there. All right, tremendous. Histogram, boy, that is dead on the money. You see that? That is dead on the money. Everything is right at the tip. That dynamic range is huge. Okay, I think we're good. We've just kind of been driving along the road and oftentimes what I'll do is, you know, drive slowly until something kind of reaches out um, and, and has an impact on me. And then we'll, I'll kind of back up and take a second pass at it always kind of looking at my surroundings paying attention to you know compositions one thing that really helps me to find that 
image in these conditions is wearing polarized sunglasses. So if you've ever attended one of my workshops or for that matter, walking down the street with me, I'm always kind of cranking my neck like this because I can see the polarization take place. And so this is really helpful um, for landscape photographers is um, really a polarizer can make the difference in a, um, in a in an okay shot and really an exceptional shot, especially once the light starts getting um, a little bit harsher, a little bit um, higher in the sky. Uh, you can still deepen those clouds and those skies up real nicely with the polarizer. For this shot right here, I'm actually using the LB Color Combo Polarizer. And that is a combination polarizer, warming polarizer, and color intensifying filter. So we're not altering any colors. We're just kind of um, bringing out those reds and oranges. Um, you can see here as we twist the filter, we've had some clouds move in a little bit now. But um, there are subtle differences in the way that sky pops back there and the way the clouds kind of stand out against that sky and we're actually going to exaggerate that even a little bit more or emphasize it with a soft step grad ND filter that we'll use. The uh, maple and the oak which are our red and orange leaves are just a little bit past peak. Um, they peaked here about three or four days ago and so I kind of need a little extra punch to bring those out of my image. We don't have a whole lot of difference in highlight and shadow from foreground to background here. So we're using a two-stop soft step grad ND filter, obviously hand holding it. Um, and actually you're gonna see me kind of cant the filter a little bit. We'll bring it right down, right here against the front element. You can kind of see the difference it makes in that background and especially the, the sky. We're gonna can it just a little bit because I want a little bit more filtration on the upper left hand corner of my image. Got to make sure we don't get that in the way. We're just going to go ahead and uh, snap a couple picks here. And we're getting some really nice definition. I got a lit foreground right here, lit ridge right here, and everything in my midground is kind of shaded and it's actually starting to come into sunlight a little bit right now. Um, the really fun thing about shooting in these conditions is that the light is changing um, so quickly and so every image is just a little bit different you may like the spotlighting a little bit more in a different part of your image so from frame to frame you can really choose um, which one works best I, I like to shoot a number of different compositions so when I see them full screen I can really choose the one that um, you know that has the most impact so I like including um, this lit grass in the foreground right here um, definitely gonna dial that polarizer in right there and you can see the difference it's making in that background just kind of get a little bit tighter on this we're gonna go ahead and bring this two stop soft step grad right up against the front element canted because I've got some dark clouds in my upper right hand corner and I really kind of want to lay off as much as I can on filtering those because I don't want them to appear unnatural um, then we're gonna get a little bit tighter right here I'm gonna go ahead and kind of use those branches as my immediate foreground and you can see I'm kind of balancing my foreground with the peak in the upper right hand corner there. I'll just get this sucker placed, get that horizon straight. There we go. You want to pay attention to the edges of your frame, particularly the bottom of your frame here. Make sure you're including enough of that image. I'm actually going to switch up filters on this. I just kind of want to get the sky, so we're going to go to a two-stop hard step here. Just bring that right down, right on that line right there. You can see the back and forth, the up and down. Despite the fact that our light has grown higher, um, we're still able to work this scene with some broken light and uh, the polarizing filter, the color combo. 
polarizer and, and our grad ND filter because we're able to kind of equalize the scene and, and really kind of bring out the color and the depth in, in this particular composition. What I'd like to do at this shot is two things, reinforce the setup and then show you the difference between shooting with variable filters and fixed filters. First the setup. I'd like to have a setup that gets you up and going quickly. So have your gear conveniently placed, ready to go, know what you'll need, and we're ready. I'm going to use two stacked fixed ND filters. Now the disadvantage of using the fixed filter is that it's always dark, so it's a little bit difficult when you're using a lot of ND to compose. The other problem is that it can be sometimes so dark that your autofocus won't work. And the real problem comes in, if you have to remove it to compose and put the filters back on, you might change settings. So not only is it slower, but you run the risk of changing your focal length or your focus. So let's put it into manual mode, ISO 50, at F22. We're going to try to get a 30 second exposure. So that means the only thing that we can really change here is the ISO or the aperture. It looks like all I can do is get to about 15 seconds with this shot. I don't have enough fixed ND to go any longer. Let's go ahead with the shot using the cable release to reduce vibrations. Remember to always turn off that image stabilization. It'll hunt for any motion and make your shot actually blurry. Good exposure. Now let's try that again, but using the variable filter. The variable filter only has a maximum eight f-stops of light reduction, so that's not going to be enough. So what we're going to do is stack our five on top of that. That'll give me from eight to 13 stops of reduction. The setup is very similar. We're still in manual mode. We're still at ISO 50. We're still at F22. But the advantage is I can dial open the filter so that I can easily see through the lens. Then, once I've got the shot composed, I'll stop the filter down. We're all set to take the exposure at 30 seconds. It won't autofocus, so I'm going to put my thumb over the eyepiece. There it autofocuses. We're shooting these sea lions at 30 seconds, and we're hoping they'll actually move a little bit creating a little feeling of life. Just a little bit overexposed, so I'm going to turn that neutral density filter down a little bit, easily adjusting the exposure. Now we're just going to wait for another set of waves and take another shot. The reason I'm waiting for waves is I'd like a nice contrast between the fixed rocks and the animals and the white waves below. So here we go. Remember to always use your loop and to check your histogram for the correct exposure. Looks good. The primary difference between the fixed and the variable filter is that you can more easily adjust your exposure and you can open it up for composing and focusing. It's well worth the extra money that you'll pay for the variable filter. Okay, I've stopped at this shot because the water attracted my attention. It's really flat today, and that means that if we go really long on our exposure, we can get a nice glassy shot. So what I'm going to do is start at about 60 second exposure. Whenever you're shooting over 30 seconds, it presents a few small problems. The first is it's so bright today that I have too much light. I'm using two neutral density filters giving me about 13 f-stops, but it's not enough. So I've added a third filter. This presents a small vignetting problem if I go wide, but fortunately for this shot, it's very tight, not a problem. The second thing is, in over 30 seconds, we'll need to shoot in bulb mode, and we'll need to use a locking shutter release. Whenever I hold the shutter down and lock it, the shutter will remain open, and releasing it closes the shutter. Now the third problem is, how do we meter something that's 60 seconds when our camera will only meter to 30 seconds? Let me show you how we do that. 
We get a correct exposure at 30 seconds, and then I underexpose by one f-stop. And now what I'll do is compensate by doubling my exposure time from 30 to 60, giving me again the correct exposure. So let's take our first shot at 60 seconds and see how it looks. Looks pretty good, but it's just a little dark. So I'm going to increase that to 75 seconds for this next shot. For the 75 second exposure, we're going to use our shutter release. We're in bulb mode and we're going to use the iPhone for our 75 second timer. Here we go. Much better. And we've got the smooth water look that we were looking for. So this is an example of shooting over 30 seconds and getting a longer exposure to provide a very smooth glassy water. All right, this is gonna look great. Sun's right at the ridge. And using a polarizer to put the, at, at a 90 degree angle, we'll take all the glare out of those leaves and whatever rocks there are in the uh, thing there. This is the ticket right here. Everything's really warm, got a nice glow to it. Polarizing the glare out of the leaves brings the color out. Yep, right there. And we're gonna spot meet it right there at about at about plus a third. Make sure our balance is good from edge to edge. And we're at F22 and we are focused about a third of the way in. Man, we are so lucky to get this light. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We got some warm light. I'm gonna add the Tony Sweet Soft Ray. It's a great filter for, uh, for weddings. Brides dress is all white, but it's also great for nature. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's tremendous. Yep, gives like a really, really, really soft look. And we'll brighten that up just a shade. Also holds back a stop of light, so I gotta overexpose slightly to bring that in. Now I'm gonna go wide after this and um, get more of the whole situation there. Come in a little more. Have that right there. Have that right. Get rid of that tree. That's too much. I don't like that. Have it all the way in. Nope. You don't want to crop too tight because you're going to miss. You're going to miss the point. You want to see some of those tree trunks. Okay, and we'll meter that again at about a third over two seconds. Okay. I'll try one more wide shot. Polarizer and no saw filter. See what that does. So I want to get um, one more real low to the ground with a wider angle lens. Get the detail on uh, this gravel road here, which is kind of cool. You know, the shadows are picking up the fence lines in the road, which is kind of neat too. So we'll do that, and then we'll uh, we'll move down the road and see what's going on. Okay, let's get down here just a little bit lower. Get more of an expansive expansive type of look and do I want that post right there I think I do okay. right about here and right about there I actually like the, the road so I'll get a little bit of that and then we'll do a little polarization I don't want to polarize too much because wide angle lenses tend to Give you patchy polarization. That's pretty good right about there. And then we'll turn the camera on. Let's try that, see how that works. And then we'll spot meter over there at about a third over. I think we're good. Okay, that needs a soft focus filter. Let's try one of those. I'm going to just shoot this real quick, and I think we're good. Thanks for joining us today. We really have just touched the tip of the iceberg on what's possible to achieve with your seeing ray filters. But you can find a whole lot more like tips, tutorials, inspiration, and techniques 
at singrayblog.com. Also feel free to check out Master Photo Workshop's series of full-length DVDs. It's like taking a professional workshop from myself, Tony Sweet, and other leading professional photographers on a variety of subjects. For more information and for sample clips, check out masterphotodvd.com. So on behalf of Singray Filters and Master Photo Workshops, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the field.